Hey, it's Norm from Tested. I'm here at Maker Faire 2015, and we ran into Valve Software. This is Alan Yates. Uh, you're working on Valve's Steam VR project, specifically the, the Lighthouse, right? Correct, yes. I was basically the, the architect of the, the Lighthouse tracking system. And Lighthouse is one of the things that made SteamVR, when we tried it at GDC this year with the HTC Vive, is such a great experience. Uh, first, a quick primer on how Lighthouse works. That's a Lighthouse base station. Uh, can you tell me about the anatomy of this? Okay, so here you have the sync blinker. This is a, an infrared beacon that essentially floods the entire space that's tracked. That emits a timing synchronization pulse that then all the receivers in the room can use to time the sweeps of laser light as they cross and determine their angle to the base station. So here you have rotating, um, we call them rotors or, or flywheels, depending on whether you're a mechanical engineer or not. But basically you've got laser beam coming down, there's a mirror inside that diverts the light out through this line length. This generates a fan of light and the fan of light moves across the world horizontally and vertically in, in sequence. From that, the sensor out in the world can determine its angle to the base station. And if you have more than one sensor or more than one base station and one sensor, you can calculate a position in three-dimensional space. And in terms of the sensor, what type of sensor is it? Like, for example, this is a prototype of what's going on top of the uh, Steam VR controller, and you have a lot of these sensors. Yes, this object has 19 sensors on it. Each one will individually pick up whatever base station signals that it can see, and from that you get a bunch of angles that say, okay, this base station's at, you know, from the base station to my sensor, I'm at an azimuth and an elevation relative to that. By knowing the configuration of sensors on this object, we can do, you know, like a triangulation problem solved to work out not only its position, but also its orientation in space. So we gotta think of this as a, like for example, a smartphone picking up satellite signals from a GPS satellites that are orbiting the Earth and triangulating its position to a much higher degree of accuracy. Now these sensors, are they expensive to make? Are there a lot of logic that goes with them? No, they're relatively simple. Each sensor has a photodiode. Now we've also invested quite heavily in making a custom ASIC solution for baking down all the electronics. So it will be very small and very simple thing to implement. Basically someone will just grab one of these photodiodes and one of these you know, pieces of silicon, they can stick it on a board and they're done. And that whole system you need to import maybe a profile of how these sensors are arranged, the structural form of this. Does that mean that it has to be in a rigid form, it can't change throughout the use? Yeah, so for the basic tracking that we're talking about here, yes, it has to be rigid. You can track angles on onto single points if you have more than one base station in view, but that there you don't have the spatial redundancy as much as, unless you have multiple base stations. So finger tracking would be problematic anyway because it's very easy to occlude your hands. But for even like the back of your hand, you can put enough sensors on that to track it reasonably well. Now, as far as requiring five sensors to get a pose, yeah, you do initially require five sensors to get a pose. Once you have a pose, we can do lock-in tracking a bit better than that. In terms of like the virtual world then, but these sensors can be on anything. They can be on fixed objects, chairs, keyboards, mice, so you know when you're wearing an HMD where those real objects are, are relative to you in the, in the space, right? Absolutely, so we're putting a lot of work now into optimizing the, the sensor placement and sensor covering so that you can disguise them in an object, you can put them around the edge of your cell phone or in your keyboard. There's obviously lensing effects associated with optical systems that we need to, need to be able to manage, and we're getting pretty good at that. We already have, as far as designing an object, we have software. If you give us like an STL file, you know, straight for your 3D printer, we can work out what the optimum arrangement of sensors is and show you how well it will track. We have software to do that, and we'll probably release that fairly shortly. Now, were you there at Valve when uh, you experimented with the QR code room? Yes, absolutely. So our early tracking system was the QR codes, but obviously that's not a very shippable solution. But very few people, maybe some enthusiasts, would love to paper their walls with those things, but uh, most people, that's not going to fly. So how did you get from the leap from plaster or wall with QR codes for marking where it's an optical system where the headset is looking at the room to basically pulling in signals? So it's sort of a mathematical duel, right? You can turn the, the whole system around inside out, and it's still a sort of an inside out tracking system, but it's using a beacon instead of a you know, QR code on the wall. It's a far more shippable solution, because instead of having to paper things everywhere, you can just put a couple of beacons up, and you've got tracking wherever you can see the beacons. Now the beacon, you call your current lighthouse because it's a laser emitter. How does it map the room, or how does it spread out across the room? So basically, it has a spinning mirror that makes a fan beam of laser light that sweeps across the room. So that, that works in one dimension. In two dimensions you need two beams and you can have an object with sensors on it that can determine its orientation by essentially triangulation. It's pretty simple mathematically 
um, but it's not completely straightforward when you start talking about three dimensions and multiple poses. And you've developed it so you only need two beacons and a certain number of the trackers on whatever you want to track in order to get real accurate low latency positional accuracy. Uh, what is that trade off? How many markers do you need? So you actually only need one base station and up to five cents, or basically five sensors to get a good pose to start with. Once you've got a tracking pose, like a lock, you can then actually use less sensors because you can coast on the IMU for a little bit. We have, in experiments with the track controller, we've got it right down to one sensor and the IMU. As long as you keep moving it around, it tracks reasonably well. Three is basically a minimum for a good pose. And so you're taking information not just from the sensors receiving the light from the beacons, combining other information from the IMU to compensate whenever there's obstruction, because you need line of sight? Yes. Yeah, it does need line of sight. Like all optical systems, it can be occluded. So the idea of having more than one base station is primarily redundancy, not actually accuracy. In the case of when you've got controllers in front of you, if you turn around away from the base station, they can't see the base station anymore. But if you have another view, another angle that the light's coming in from, then it's much more difficult to occlude them. And do the base stations communicate with each other in terms of overlapping, so they're, or is it just unique signals? They can. So there's a couple of different modes, actually a lot of different modes that Lighthouse can operate in. The modes that you've seen at GDC, they were synchronized with each other via a wire. That is not the only mechanism they can operate in. They can operate asynchronously from each other where they run at different speeds, or they can use different carrier frequencies um, where they're sort of synchronous, or they can be completely synchronous as well. And all of these different modes are just different ways to either increase accuracy or scale so that these beacons can work with each other. So scalability is a big thing with the Lighthouse system, because you talk about needing, you, know, you only really need the one in the five sensors, but you can have more lighthouses, how do you envision it being scaled out? So it was designed from day one to be very scalable because you know, basically the, the beacons currently have a range of about five meters, that's primarily limited by the optical power of the, the synchronization signal. The, in order to scale, you can basically just add more. That, the software for that is still somewhat work in progress, but the, the general design of the system completely allows you know, any number of base stations to be used. So the, the the current talking point of you know a 15 foot by 15 foot room right now that's just a comp, that's the optimal point for the two base station that five meter range and the software how it scales so far right correct yes so that's a good shippable solution it gives you a good experience in you know full 360 tracking basically you can't it's very difficult to occlude it you've you've experienced it yourself right it's you can almost put the thing under your arm and it still works yeah yeah you know it doesn't matter if you you know, have the two controllers overlapping each other they they're it's smart enough and it's not very computationally intensive because you said it's just basic math triangulation. Yeah. Um, now, how does the room then in that system, like how do, how do you know where the walls are in the room? Okay, so the walls in the room, are, they know, because the base stations give you an absolute coordinate system, you can work out where the walls are. So at the moment we have a calibration procedure where you use the headset or the uh, controller to actually measure things in the world. So you measure the ground, you can measure, go, okay, I don't want to go any further than this, click, and that gives you the geometry of the room. Now, there are other techniques that we might talk about in the future about how you would work out, say, where something that's moving in the room might be. But for the moment, fixed geometry is pretty simple to scan in just by touching off points. And I imagine the base stations need to be locked in place. You don't want those things to move at all. Now, can they be self-powered like with a USB cable and a power brick? And yeah, that, that's exactly how they're designed. They, they don't talk to the computer at all. They just simply produce the signal that the tracking tracked objects can interpret. So we've got ones that will run off a power brick, like a, like a, a battery, in for about a day. But they'll be wired, they'll take power, and that's pretty much it. Now, you guys are at Maker Faire because you're obviously looking at using Lighthouse in applications outside of virtual reality. How do you envision people, makers, using Lighthouse as a positional tracking system? Uh, very good question. So, obviously, these things are going to be in great number out in the world very soon, but essentially by Christmas. So, a lot of people are going to want to use them for non VR applications. Robotics and micro flight applications like quadcopters are obviously a, a very obvious way that you'd want to use an absolute tracking system. We want to facilitate that by, I mean, anyone can license Lighthouse. Really the only entrance into Lighthouse is to not violate the standards so that all systems are, can interoperate with each other. We'll be offering technical information about how to utilize the system. We'll be offering as, as much as possible the components as off-the-shelf things that you can just buy a digi-key and put into your project. 
you mentioned uh, quadcopter. So is that, is that something like outdoor use? What are the limitations of Lighthouse for, for the space that you can use it in? Like, could you have it set up in a room like this? Yes, yeah, so you could totally set up in a room like this. Um, they obviously take a fair number of base stations with their current design to operate out to that. There are many ways that you can scale Lighthouse, including you can increase the range by making it give you slower updates, for example. One of the uh, like the limitations is the sync blinker power. The lasers already can go out to 20 meters easily and still be eyesight. The 20 meters radially is huge, right? It's a 40 meter circle. That's that's uh, like a, a stadium, yeah. Whereas the sync blinkers are a little bit weaker than that. You can have sync repeaters. There's a bunch of different ways you can make it scale, or you can use RF. Now, that's the things that we should probably talk to the community about how they're actually going to use it, and they can give us feedback on what's probably the best way to take the technology. Who else have you talked to about? possibly licensing Lighthouse for their applications. Is it consumer electronics? Is it research? We've been, a lot of people have spoke to us about it. A lot of researchers, um, a lot of consumer developers as well. And hopefully their experience will feed back to how we can use it for, to improve the VR experience as well, right? Absolutely, so all, uh, all users of Lighthouse will feed back into the, the general, you know, protocol and, and set up of the system. We'll probably come up with some kind of standards committee that will have be the steward of the standard going forward. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Alan, for explaining a little bit more about the Lighthouse, how it works, uh, and your, your vision for how it might be used in VR and other places. Thank you. So that's it for Maker Fair 2015. We'll have more stuff from this show on Tesla.com. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Norm from Tesla, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.